Well, if, if you were to have offered to you uh, one million dollars right now, or were given a penny, you could double the penny every day for a month and save it each day, which offer would you take? If you could take the offer of a million at the beginning of a month, that seems to be a safe deal. But if you were to take the penny and it was doubled every day, by day 25, you would have $167,000. Not too bad. By day 27, you would have $668,000. Better yet. But by day 31, you would jump to $10.7 million, and now you would be $9.7 million richer than the one who took the $1 million at the beginning of the month. This is the power of multiplication, which I want to talk about this morning. We have been talking about loving God, loving others, making disciples, and how about loving God is the fuel that makes us wants to make disciples and multiply disciples. Well, we see in the early church that it had exploded throughout all of Asia Minor in about 60 years. What were they doing that made such an impact on the world that was lost as so many people are today. They had no big church programs, no internet, no printing press. They had the basics of the gospel delivered to them. The scriptures and the oral, oral teaching was passed down. They had the letters of Paul, which were distributed through some churches around, and the message of Jesus and the gospel had spread through people who gave their whole lives to him. Now many of you are sitting here today 2,000 years later and are following Jesus. What is the spirit-empowered movement that changed so many lives, and why are you here today or are, are listening today? those of you who are not here. Well, the text that I want to focus on today is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And if you have your Bibles, please uh, open them to this passage. Or you can go to page 995 in the Black Bible in the rack in front of you. Or you will see it on your screen. Many, many uh, ways to see this today. But the scripture says this, You therefore, my son, says Paul speaking to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have seen or have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another morning that we can focus on making disciples and multiplying disciples in this world. And Lord, we know that there are so many in, in this world that still need to know you and this hope of this great gospel. And Lord, you have charged the church to do your work by your Holy Spirit and your power and your grace. So I pray that today you may help us, encourage us, Convict us, if need be, to do this task. So number one, if you're following along in an outline that I've got there, we multiply by being strong in the grace of Christ. In verse 1, Paul is saying to Timothy, You therefore, my son, be strong, that is, in Christ Jesus. This letter that Paul writes is not to just a church, but is to an individual, Timothy. It is his last letter written by Paul when he is in house arrest in Rome. 
Paul calls Timothy his son. It's a very endearing term. And why is because Paul led Timothy to Jesus and he discipled him. He's like a spiritual father to Timothy. And again, Father's Day, isn't this great to think about that? And Candace said it earlier. We have many of those who are spiritual fathers to others in this congregation, and, and that's what we, de we desire for those around our community. But men, fathers, uh, we pray that you may take be a spiritual leader, especially in the home in these difficult days. But Paul is like a spiritual father to Timothy, and he exhorts him to be strong in the grace that's in Christ. This is the enabling grace that we receive through our union with Christ when we believe. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. In 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy 1.14, just a few verses up, it says, Guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. So, the Holy Spirit, if you are a believer in, in Christ, you have Jesus Christ in you by the power of his Spirit. And think about the impact that you have in following Jesus with the Holy Spirit's power within you and his grace. And I may ask you, who are your spiritual parents and why? We can be encouraged by those who have lived faithfully in Christ to follow their example, to watch what they do, and we lean on the strength and grace given to us by Jesus to walk in him every day. Now secondly, we multiply through spiritual generations of disciples. In this passage, we see four plus generations of disciples. Paul to Timothy, Timothy then to faithful people, and those faithful people will teach others also. And we pray so on, right? This shows us the power of strategic, intentional relationships empowered by God's Spirit. Think about the time when Jesus began to call his first disciples. Some were fishermen. He said to them, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets, it says, and followed him. In the account in, in Luke chapter 5, of course, uh, this is when they're fishing out in the boat, and Jesus says, put your nets on the other side of the boat. They said, we've been fishing all night. This is now working. Do it. And they put their nets on the other side of the boat, and all of a sudden, their nets are tearing with northern pike and walleye and bass and crappies. <laughs> They knew there was something amazing to this guy. As we have learned, Jesus' last words to his disciples were, Go and make disciples of all the nations. Many of you who are sitting today are followers of Jesus because we stand on the shoulders of those who have faithfully lived out and testified to the great news of Jesus to this day. Paul gives us some great insight that we could easily pass over in our text today about how this movement of making disciples happens. Third, think about we multiply disciples by our lives. So Paul was with Timothy, and he says, Think of the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. Now this, this word heard... It's the word akuo. Think of this as a broader term in the sense that what you have learned from me, Paul is saying, things that you have heard me say and the things you have seen me do is and being confirmed by others. 
You see, he is saying that I, I have done this all in the open. You can see and you have heard my words about who Jesus is. And he continues to preach the gospel continue, all the time. I mean, this is what Paul is about. So what did Timothy see, learn, and hear from Paul? Well, in Acts chapter 16, Paul is in his now second missionary journey. And in Lystra, he meets Timothy. And Paul wants to take Timothy on his journey, sharing the gospel, planting churches. And he says, as I go, we will make disciples. And this is not long after, right? Just before this, in chapter 14 of Acts, Paul is... Just, just has healed a man, and there's, there's all kinds of hubbub in this, this city, and he is stoned, left for dead. In fact, they think he's dead. And some disciples come around him and are like, Paul, like, you know, are you okay? And, and he gets up, and he goes back into the same city, right? Well, we don't know if this is some kind of, like, miracle or some he, he just is a tough dude or something but <laughs> right but he goes back into the city and he continues to preach I mean this is a commitment because he believes in Jesus that there is this is the only hope of the world and Timothy now comes into this and he's seeing what Paul is doing there was, it was action packed there was a lot to learn and Timothy was with him in his second and third missionary journeys. Well, this is what heard entails through life and in truth. In 2 Timothy, same book now, uh, chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, it says this. But you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance along with the persecutions and sufferings that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, <clears throat> the very place where, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul met Timothy. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. So this is what Timothy is experiencing, teaching Paul encourages Timothy to stay strong in the sound teaching of being an example. Conduct is just a way of life. What was Paul's way of life? What did he say? I love this in Acts 20, verse 24. It's one of my favorite things that Paul says there. But I consider my life of no value to myself, but the purpose to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. What do we know about God, Paul's purpose? In Philippians 1.21, he says, for, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul wrote actually four other letters that he wrote from prison. And he writes from house arrest now in Rome to Timothy. And he longs to see them. He talks about, I mean, this is patience, right, Paul? He, he many times is in prison. And people were taking advantage of him even while he was in prison. But he had patience because he knew the gospel was the most important thing. And love he again, he talks about Timothy as being his son, how he loves him as a son. Endurance, persecution, suffering, and take these as one, right? I mean, think about all of the enduring things that Paul did. Being shipwrecked, being beaten with rods, going from place to places, and, and, and uh, being without food, being hungry. He explained this all in 2 Corinthians. It's amazing if you read that. And he reminds of what happened there, right there in Lystra. He was stoned, he was left to death dead, but he came and said, Timothy, 
you're, you're something here. I want to take you on. And let's go. Let's make disciples. For we multiply disciples by entrusting ourselves to faithful people. Now, entrust here is kind of a banking term. It means to invest. So we invest in people who are faithful and who will also build and equip others to follow Jesus to do the same. And so, here's a nice little graphic here. <laughs> we see Paul going to Timothy and then to faithful people, as you could see, faithful people, and then to others. And it's kind of like this, as you see that uh, whole series go out. And this is a multiplying effort that happens. We, we're making the kind of disciples who will multiply, and this takes time and investment and intentionality. These are all words that we've been talking about. I often talk about what are the qualities of a disciple maker? You can see him up there. I like this faith principle. It means to be first faithful. To live out the gospel and spend time with the Lord in his word. Secondly, available. Are you freeing up your schedule for enough time to pour your lives into others? Because this takes time. It, it's an investment of time into others. It's intentional. Do you have relationships that have purpose in leading them closer to Jesus? Or to Jesus for the first time? Do you know the gospel so well that you can explain it clearly to others? If you don't, I want to challenge you to that. Understand and know the gospel. Why did Jesus come? Why did he come for you? What's the stuff about the cross? I hear many people all the time that I preach the gospel to that say, Jesus died for, my, for our sins. They know this part, but there's a disconnection. And I am asking why Jesus had to die. Why did he die? Why did he suffer? This cruel Roman cross put nails through his, his hands and his feet. And the crown of thorns crushed on his head and being bloodied. Why so much cruelty? And many of us don't connect the dots. We don't see it. And I ask, well, why didn't Jesus have to just, why didn't he come, be a great teacher and everything, and just go to heaven, God just snatch him up? Why not? Why all this cross stuff, this, this being so cruelly beaten and all of that? Why? We need to understand the whole sacrificial system of the Old Testament that it was an only an unblemished lamb that the, was taken to the priest and slaughtered once a year for the sins of the people. But it was only a symbol of something that would come. Jesus, our final sacrifice. He was the substitute for us. There's no other way. We cannot come to Jesus without that. That's the way. Do we know this? Do we know about his death and resurrection? That he was victorious over sin and death? And that he ascended to the right hand of the throne of God forever to intercede for each and every one of you and give his Holy Spirit, which we just talked about, for in the enablement and the power to live for him. Do you know this gospel? It's the only hope of the world. 
It is it. There is nothing else. Every, I always say this, Christianity, it's the only if religion, but it's really a relationship, right? But it's the only religion on the face of this earth that's a done religion. It's been already done for us on the cross, what he did. Every other religion is a do religion. What we must do, how it work for the receive, get nirvana, or pray five times a day to over here, or eat the right things. And only if we do this, then maybe, just maybe, we might be right with God, and he'll accept us into heaven if we just maybe do the right things. This is not the gospel. The gospel turns it all on its head and said, Jesus did it all, and he's given a gift. All you need to do is repent from your sin and receive him, the gift of grace. Wow, is this not great? This is the truth of Jesus Christ. This is the only hope of the world. We must know this gospel so that we can preach it to all people and expand it and multiply it because we need to. This world, you know what this is like. And we need to be passing the baton on to the next generation. So if you work in the nursery or are a primary children's teacher or you're a youth worker or a small group Bible study leader, the question is, who can come alongside you? Who are you training to lead the next generation of spiritual followers and leaders of Jesus Christ who know him and know this gospel? Other leadership in church includes me. Who are we investing our lives into the, in order to lead the church wisely for the future? I give an illustration. Uh, recently I had to fix the brakes on my truck in the front and I was a little bit not sure how to do that. And thankfully I have a son who is a little more mechanical than me. So he comes over and we're taking the wheels off and I was hearing this, you know, the scraping sound, not good, just to let you know. And uh, so he comes over, takes a three ton jack, bringing it up and um, and so I'm looking there and it's okay these are the rotors these are the pads these are, you have to lift this up and you know, go out like this and so I'm watching this and so I'm starting to do this too and we're doing it together so this here this little illustration thing um, actually Brittany was telling me that uh, this was uh, that comes out of language right language learning and, but it's, it's a great principle. It's also in a book called From Spiritual Multiplication in the Real World. It's a fantastic book. You can get it, McDab. Just look it up. But anyway, it's the I do, you watch, right? So if I'm a knower, watch. Watch what I do. This is what Paul did with Timothy. And then now we're going to do it together. So I'm looking in, saying, okay, that's, that's that rotor thing, and we're going to, okay, put that on, and, right? Got to order the parts first, of course. I found that was a trick. <laughs> and then, now, you do, and I watch. Well, that's a little bit harder, because I might mess something up, which I normally do, and... But no, no, put that here and then, yeah, I lift that, okay. And then, now you do, now I fully learned this whole thing. He says, now you do it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check in, see, it, see how it's done. It's, I mean, is it still scraping? No, this is, this is amazing. It actually doesn't. <laughs> um, but one more, the scripture is telling us, it's just like, you do and now you equip somebody else. See, we have the greatest news in the world. We can't just leave it like, I want to, this is so cool that I learned how to change brakes out and stuff. I want to tell everybody, this is awesome. 
This is so much fun. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but Jesus, yes. Yeah. I mean, we can all do this. If we know Jesus and we know the gospel, this is so exciting because we know the hope of the world. So if anybody comes along or walks along down the street, it's like, hi, I just met a guy yesterday. And I was like, hi, who are you? I live over, I'm a neighbor over here. Good to meet you. Where are you from? Get to know him. What's, what's this sign over here? Many of you know that we have a sign in front of our house, the refuge. And it comes from Psalm 46, 1. For God is a refuge and our strength, a very present help in time of need. Isn't that great? God helps us in our time of need. Do you have a need? He began to pour out his heart of his, his father with cancer and his mother to just knew, just found out that she had cancer. He was, he was hurting inside and I was able to, to talk with him. But something simple. It takes intentionality. But we can do it. Who are the people in your sphere of influence so you can open the window of your life to help them see a picture of what it means to be a follower of Christ? You can do this anywhere. I used to work for Fairview uh, hospitals in Wyoming, Minnesota. This was my goal every single day. Lord, give me one person today that, that you can help me just open the window a little bit to see what does it look like for a Jesus follower in our home. And many times I'd say, oh, it's, you know, the weekends. What what'd you do this weekend? Well, I mean, I rem I just I remember this very well. This we had a baptism that weekend, and and we have baptism coming up this July, right? So great opportunity, but we just well we had a we had a baptism this Sunday. It was just it was amazing. I mean, people came and they they talked about who Jesus was in their life, and I got to share a little mini gospel right there. Open up the window. Knowing what do you do around your table? I mean, what kind of food do you eat? Oh, I love to eat. You know what we do? We, we come together as a family and we pray together. And we give thanks for God. For he has given us everything. It's just so great. And they be, after a while, you know, people begin to know you are a person of faith in Jesus. And when the chips are down and when there's hard things and whatever, guess who they're going to call? They're going to call you. It could be a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a co-worker, <clears throat> a student in school, someone with the same interests or hobbies, people with whom you participate or watch sports with, or families with children with similar ages. God has placed these people in their lives and only you can reach them. I can't reach them all. It's not the one to many. It's the many to everyone. It's, it's not how many seeds are in an apple. It's how many apples are in the seed. So that's the multiplication we want to see. But we need to set aside some time and invest in their lives and, or invite them into your rhythm of life and adjust your life sometimes so they can see who this Jesus is. <clears throat> Fifth, we multiply together on mission. And the process that we're saying, because I'm one of them, is that we, it starts with shepherd leaders to equip the church for multiplying disciples. This is where we want to continue to go as a church. To equip you to be disciple-making multipliers. <laughs> That's where we want to go and continue to go. And we want to move from primarily... A teaching church, we're good at this. We're good at teaching. We're good at knowing things, right? And this is much of our Western society, but we love to know stuff. You get a lot up here. 
but it's reached down in our heart and reach out there. So we want to move from a teaching church to an equipping church. We want to equip you to have, so that you can have the right tools. It's skills that you need. How do I, how do I prepare this gospel? How do I share this? And, and then we do it. We must, we need each other to be guided by scripture, by prayer, to be accountable to each other, and to care for one another as we engage our world for Christ. We need each other. This world is not easy. It's hard. We all know this. And there's so many distractions in this world. And we need to be accountable to each other. So we say, yeah, my, my friend George, I was sharing with him this week about Jesus. And I don't know if he quite got it, but, you know, at least he, he didn't reject me. And, and we can be in a group together and we pray and we say, well, keep going at it. We're going to pray for you. And we're going to ask you next week how, how it went. And you're sharing about Jesus in your life. In Acts 2.42, it says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They invested in each other's lives and were sent out to the world and, and came back to pray and be encouraged again. This is like the penny illustration I talked about in the beginning. They multiplied disciples and churches and grew and grew and grew. That was the explosion that happened. So, what if, what if we began to think in terms of multiplying disciples, not just adding? In this graphic here, in the early church, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. This is following Jesus daily in my life and investing in the lives of others who will teach others, who will live out their lives to others, to others, to others. And we have spiritual generations who multiply this world for Jesus. I'm telling you, mass evangelism won't work all the time. We can't depend on that. We have often taken this model and reversed it. Come and listen. Come to the church and listen. And sometimes, you know, we go, we go to church and we listen and we leave and we forget about it. <laughs> and we're content with just going to church and leaving our faith here. That's not the church. It's not the church. It's not what we were called to do. We need to do more than just add people to our, our number, but we need to start multiplying disciples who will multiply other disciples. We want to intentionally focus this way at Chisholm Baptist Church in order to see a movement of Christ followers, followers who will not only affect the Iron Range, but all nations for generations to come. This was read earlier. I love it. Matthew 24, verse 14. The good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. As we look around in the world, many of us would like, to, would like for Jesus to come like right now. Just take us out of this world, man. This is horrible. I don't like this. Twinkle me out of here. <laughs> Beam me up, Jesus. <laughs> but when we see the world through Jesus' eyes, it is not time to sit back, but engage this lost and broken world. It's broken. 
There's sinners who are wounded. And they've lost their way. Our very same Jesus, our Savior, wept about the same thing. Those lost and broken sinners. So must we. And the task of making disciples is not done until all nations have, have the gospel proclaimed to them. God has made each one who is his follower, his follower of Christ, to make disciples of others. Where are you on this journey? You know, it matters not where you are on this journey. It's a journey. And we're all moving, right? It's the movement toward Christ. And there's ups and downs. And again, we've, we've talked about this sanctification process. It's a process of knowing more and more in Christ and, and growing in Him and, and messing up a little bit. But it's, it's hopefully we're kind of like going like this direction in movement toward Him. That's the goal. But it doesn't matter where you are. You could be, maybe you're not a disciple this morning. Maybe you, you're not a believer in Jesus right now today. But that's the first step. Believe upon him and there's hope. And he gives you power for this journey. So where are you at? Where are you at today? I'm praying that you are on the journey of multiplying disciples who will multiply disciples. Find the people in your sphere of influence and find people who are faithful, who want to, who are hungry, who have these, the faith principle and bring them to your side and live life together. Say, we want to take the hill for Jesus. Because he's worthy. We sang about this King of Kings. He alone is worthy of all of it because someday every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every people will be gathering at his throne, worshiping him alone. There'll be nobody else. He's jealous of his own glory, and he's worthy. Amen. Amen.